on food and nutrition for children's health. I'm really excited for this panel. It's been very interesting seeing a lot of different standpoints and some of the different areas of expertise. And um, with my background in the fitness population and nutrition as well, I've, I've learned so much even just from a couple of conversations. So it's I'm um, very lucky to introduce Mike Lesnar that has his own uh, production show, uh, the Mike Lesnar Productions on CBS, and he has been shown in over 80 countries. So. Hi, everybody. Um, my perspective on all of this today is going to be coming to you as someone first and giving you my profound apologies because I'm my career at an ad agency called Leo Burnett. And Leo Burnett was a famous ad agency. <laughs> this is getting very confusing. Yes. All right. Wait, let me suspend this for one second. Uh, Certainly boy, many of you remember this. I was at many of the meetings when this was developed. Um, and I'll connect it up in a second. You guys have been regaled enough. All right, let me tell you why I'm that every product in the world either has an inherent drama and it will speak it to you, or you have to create a drama for it. And of course, you have to create the drama when you're dealing with a product which has absolutely no reason for being and should not be on the planet. There's still somebody with a warehouse filled with that product who wants to sell it. And I, and, and, and I think you're going to start following where I'm going with this. So early on, I sat in meetings with Kellogg, Battle Creek. And at the time, Kellogg had eight of the top ten cereal brands in the United States. Now, the guys at Kellogg were cigar-smoking guys who had a lot of crummy cereal that was sugar-coated, that rotted children's teeth. It had absolutely no reason for being but they were not going to listen to any ad agency tell them, hey, we can't sell your product because it's just no good. There were many, many other success stories. One of the most notable ones, the Marlboro Man for Philip Morris. Look how crummy that product was. So the whole idea was drawing out inherent drama to sell a product. And this is kind of go to, going to go to what we're going to talk about here a little bit today with our panel. Uh, we pretty much... I think everybody in the room knows that there's a child obesity problem in this country. Second, actually, to Mexico only. Which is, you know, that, that's kind of bizarre that our country would, would be in that position, but clearly the numbers show that we've got a real problem with obesity. So we're not here to de debate whether or not we've got a problem. We have a very real problem. Um, after working on that some years later, I started to get the opportunity to redeem myself a little bit. Disney called me and they said, will you help us create something called Disney's Healthy Kids, which is going to be an interactive game utilizing the food pyramid. So this is kind of funny for me because when you dumb it down to its purest elements, it takes me from snap, crackle, and pop and, and planting in children they need this stuff and planting in parents, the kid won't sh shut up until you buy that stuff. Now you move fast forward to the food pyramid where the little kids can learn about healthier foods. As we were all kind of laughing about, uh, most recently though, even the food pyramid was flawed. Had a bunch of foods on it that weren't quite right. And this is, this is for the people who spend day in, day out trying to figure out what's good and what's not good. And, and we will do that. 
So my sort of 30,000 foot value to this group of, of really terrific panelists is not to argue that there's a problem. There is a problem, obviously. My passion for this is I know you can crawl inside the heads of children with interaction. I've done Elmo's potty time, coping with chemo for Starlight Foundation, um, an asthma series for the University of Texas. There's ways you can talk to children with tools that are proven in the toolbox. What it's going to be good for us to talk about, I think, today is some of the different approaches that we're going to have. And uh, first up is Dr. Maya Adam. And uh, Dr. Adam has, has published a, a whole online series uh, uh, based on the Stanford Pediatric Program. And she's going to kind of get the ball rolling. And then after that, we have some kind of complementary yet not necessarily fixed or in agreement uh, uh, viewpoints with Joanna Strober, who's uh, Kerbo Health and who deals with inter uh, interactive uh, uh, mobile uh, uh, information uh, to kids for weight loss, and Karina Perez, who comes at it from the side of a clinical dietitian who has a very, very interesting take of her own on how we should approach this problem and what we can do. After the panel gives a short little spiel on kind of where they're coming from and you can kind of crawl in their heads a little bit, uh, then we'll kind of open up and we'll talk a little bit about some of the questions you have uh, about uh, uh, tackling this uh, this uh, diabetic, excuse me, this uh, uh, dietary epidemic. So Maya, um, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me in the back? Okay. Um, so it's interesting. If I had to summarize, and I think you know, Mike's summary was excellent. The big problem here is that we put control over what goes into our children's bodies in the hands of people who don't have a vested interest in their long-term health. So one potential solution that we are very excited about exploring is how can we put that power back into the hands of the people who actually have a very vested interest in the long-term health of the consumer, and that is the parent. And the, the thinking behind our Stanford Child Nutrition and Cooking course is that if we can support parents in a return to simple home cooking, where they're not using you know, high wire act food network recipes with multiple things, but they're using basic ingredients to make simple foods, and they are the ones controlling the fat, sugar, and salt, that even though this presents a challenge for many people in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of energy, what we've seen in parents around the world, even in the poorest parts of the world, is that when you make a parent aware that their child's health is at risk, there will be a subtle reallocation of resources towards the support of that child's health. And if we can then make this act of cooking into something feasible, something fun, something that will add value to the family life, rather than being a punitive solution where we say these foods are forbidden and you're no longer allowed to eat them, but rather we say, hey, this is going to add so much fun to your life. You get to spend time with your children. You can eat together as a family again. You can take them with you into the vegetable section and let them choose whatever they want and try it out, resources permitting. Those kinds of solutions we feel to be more solution-oriented and positive, and we hope to reach many families. Our online course has reached 250,000 families so far, and we've collected very positive data on the changes in eating behaviors of the parents. Not so, we haven't collected data on the changes in eating behaviors of the children, so that's the next step. But by changing the parental behavior, we hope to also influence the children's consumption for the better and for the protection of their health. When he was 11, the doctor, instead of saying he's gonna outgrow it, said, oh, you have a big problem, you need to worry about this. And, um, she made him feel terrible. She made me feel terrible. I felt like a failure as a mother because clearly I had a problem that I wasn't doing things right about. And um, it was actually, it was very painful. She said she wouldn't sign his camp form because his uh, blood pressure was high. 
and his blood pressure was high. Actually, it wasn't high. They just, she freaked him out about his weight, and then she weighed him. So it was, um, it was a very traumatic experience for our family. So I spent my background, my background is in technology, and um, I, I spent a lot of time looking at what I was supposed to do to help him. And if you Google weight loss for kids, not very much comes up. Um, so I started talking to the folks at the Stanford Pediatric Weight Control Clinic, and I think it's a program that's very much like Karina's. It's a great program to help kids lose weight. That program was $3,500, and um, even worse for me as a working mom, you had to go there in person. And um, I couldn't, I didn't know how to do that. How was I going to leave my other two kids? How was I going to commit him for six months to go there in person? It was a really big challenge. But I could see that it was a good program. So um, we convinced them to license us our, their program. And what we've done is turned it into an interactive approach where we have apps to teach kids healthier habits. We teach them portion control. We teach them that orange juice is really not such a good choice. Neither is Capri Sun or Pop-Tarts. Um, we teach them alternatives for different things. And then um, we give them a coach. And so essentially, we try to take the role of the food police away from the parent. I think for me, I started creating a lot of issues with my son. As I tried to make changes, it became a very emotional issue between the two of us. And so um, I learned that taking that away from the parent and actually putting it into a third party who could make suggestions to the child in a less emotional way would, um, would be able to help them. And so uh, we've been going, we launched it over a year ago, and the really exciting thing is that we're getting the same weight loss results as people do in in-person programs. So um, we're able to see the kids are, are changing their behaviors, and we're starting to work with health plans and um, Pentagon. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but they think that obesity is one of the biggest problems facing the nation because kids are actually not able to go fight because they're so overweight. Um, so we're working with all sorts of... Um, medical providers to um, to get Kirko out to, to more families. But for me, it is very personal. It is, I think advertising was a big part of it. I'm sure my son was buying really unhealthy foods when he left the house, right? And, I, you know, and every time he went out with his friends, he was probably getting those unhealthy foods. And so I do think that advertising is a big part of it. Um, but but also some of it was just behavioral. That he, he, liked, he liked eating. We had to figure out strategies. That was originally a Canadian food company that said, we want to be the biggest frozen food company in the world. And Leo Burnett said, well, then you've got to change your name, and your vegetables come from a lush green valley guarded by a giant in a green loincloth who goes, ho, ho, ho. Can you see the faces of the owners of this company? They did it. And after they did it, within a year and a half, they were the biggest frozen food company. And you bring in the team of shrinks, and you say, how did you do this? You did it because there's a giant, which says a larger green bean. There's a valley with a giant guarding it, which says a protected vegetable. There's ho, ho, ho in a goofy character, which makes the kids say, I want that one. And the reality is all vegetables are the same. They're all on the shelves, and mom walks down the aisle, and the kid points, or mom gets some sort of safety image or giant green bean image, and boom, the sale is made, and big business is happy. And big business is a huge component to this because they're not going away. They are Goliath. We're David. We have to be selective in our battles because look how long cigarettes have been around and continue to be around. And how much dope do we have on cigarettes? I think it's fairly well settled. They're probably not good for you. Loosely, because I don't know the exact words he used. But he talked, he wrote a brilliant article once on how often the argument, for example, against promoting cooking is that many people don't have access to fresh foods because they don't have access to a supermarket. And so he said, and I thought it was brilliant, he said, we need to fight poverty not cooking. We need to fight the fight where we get more access to supermarkets where basic ingredients are available and we need to continue to promote home cooking as a means of promoting health. We need to keep giving the education and the access to apps because in, in tandem those two things together are going to start addressing the problem. Just because we have some families in the world and it's, it's tragic that there are some families in this country who do not have access to a supermarket. They need to go to the gas station where they can find anything even resembling a fruit. And that's tragic, but that should not make us be anti-cooking as a solution. 
because then we're not getting anywhere. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? I thought that was an interesting argument, and it's not mine, it's Mark Bittman's. So I don't know what, what you ladies think about that. So we do think a lot of it is education, even. So understanding that you can switch to Diet Coke. Let, I'm not gonna tell you that you have to have water, okay? Like, there's gonna be discussions about this, but you know, explaining that Gatorade is a problem, um, explaining that the, the sugar cereal that you're buying is a problem, you're going to the store, you're getting cereal, getting them to switch to the non-sugar cereals. There are things, there's education that you can give families, even in the poorest neighborhoods, about changes, simple changes that they can make that get their kids healthier. So I can tell you we're working on two Medicaid trials, and I'm working with inner kids city, inner city children in Ohio and in Oregon, and we're able to get. They have they have very little access to food, but just teaching those parents and teaching the kids how to make better choices seems to um, be able to impact them. I think it's one of the messages that we give is that it needs to be very general for the population, and it has to be straightforward. So some of the, the strategies that we use with our families is the 10 Healthy Habits, and they're the 2007 Expert Committee recommendations for the American Academy of Pediatrics. They're easy to say, but I think it really comes down to the strategies to help families implement. So if it's increased fruits and vegetables, which we've all heard, to daily, how do we help that family do that? The first step is taking out in the home the competing foods. And I think as a parent, you've always been there. If you go to a party and there's carrots there and there's cookies there, I think even myself as a dietitian will probably grab the cookies. So it's not just the child is making that choice. I think it's hard for everybody because these foods are engineered to take control of our, of our pleasure centers and to really enjoy that. Um, so that would be one strategy. The other thing is, is we go back and forth. Is I, I don't think parents from our families that we see have enough parenting skill set to be able to take children to the store. And even my family who is well educated, you know, I think I did a survey for coming here and I said, you know, would you take your child to the store? He says, no, absolutely not. I could do the same things at home. My parents never took me to the store. They didn't ask me. My parents took the leadership role. And I think empowering parents, that would be another message that we could bring and saying, you know what's right. I think innately a parent wants to do the right thing. I am not a parent. I am an aunt. But I think I'm interviewing more than 3,000 families as far as comparing how does it feel to go to the store with a child and without a child. And I've learned from the same families that are teaching me is that it's less stressful, they can do shopping a lot easier, it's a lot faster, they actually save money for these low income families. They save money by not taking children to the store. And we need to actually study the practices of these families. They shop three times more often than the average American. That's cultural. And so if you take a child not once, one time per week, but three times per week, you're spending more money. And parents know that. The other thing that's cultural about this family is that they, if, if, if a family only has one car, dad has a lot of pull. So clinically, I'm seeing the mom, but I know dad is at home, or he's working, and he can't come to the visit, or he doesn't feel that that is his role, and he, he will have a lot of pull at the store. So it's not just the children for these families, it's also the dads. So keeping the strategies simple, accessible, works for these families. Uh, it depends how you deliver it. I think that a lot of families feel either they don't belong or it's scary or that the language that they prefer is not going to be there. We work with urban farms, so we work with Veggie Lucian, and we also work with Second Harvest Food Bank, which is big in San Mateo and Santa Clara County as a food bank and we give them vouchers. So if the family gives me the reason of access, then it's almost like, how are you gonna brush your teeth? Well, we're gonna give you a toothbrush and we're gonna give you the paste so that you're able to do it, right? And so that is another strategy, but it takes time and money to do it clinically. When we're talking about a public health and a message that's bigger and broader, that might not be the answer. You know, clinically, I tailor it to that family. If they tell me they don't have this, if they tell me they don't have a physical activity resource, then I asset map where they live and figure out the closest YMCA that's low cost. We have collaborations with them in providing them scholarships, but that's tailored. We want to attack the problem in a different angle. I mean, it is an angle, but it's costly to a healthcare system. I think what we're here today is how do we create a bigger message that is impactful? What, uh, uh, let me throw in a question myself because I'm actually very, very interested in, in what you're talking about. Where do you guys come out on genetically engineered foods? 
I, I ask this because I have a friend in completely self-contained growing bins for all of the surrounding underserved, uh, in some cases impoverished populations to give them better things to eat. I don't have the expertise in this. Uh, um, my daughter just wrote a report on it. I quote the report for her, her 17 year old report actually educated me. Is, your mind, is your mind generally open to it? I mean, yes. If it's validated? Yes. But, uh, but I don't know that it's going to make an impact on whether kids lose weight. Um, can I first, before I take that one line, and I would love to take that one, but can I just make one last comment on the farmer's market and the shopping with the children? You will do anything. Okay. So I, I love that you brought up the increasing number of farmer's markets and the fact that they're accepting food stamps. I totally see where Karina is coming from. In the practical short term, you need to get these, and we need to give them the skills to survive in this food environment as adults. And I think that starts in childhood. It starts with us teaching them to shop the perimeter of the supermarket where the fresh produce is. It starts with us teaching them by example that we can get excited when it's green bean season or when it's heirloom tomato season. And, and that is something that's infectious. It's a positive message. But if we can do that, and I know it's hard, but if we can do that and we can educate parents about the importance of them getting excited in front of their kids about the right things, then we have a powerful solution. And using technology, like our wonderful platforms for massive open online learning that's available to anyone with an internet access, that is a powerful way, if we can get the message across in a way that is engaging and fun, as, as Mike has been saying. Could I just make a comment about our experience in Australia? We um, re completely remove cigarette packaging. There is no marketing allowed in the country now for cigarettes. You're not allowed to advertise them in any store. They're not allowed to advertise them on TV. All the packets are plain, they have no brand. So we've now got smoking rates down to 7%. And there's a number of public health experts and bureaucrats who have spent their careers fighting this. The cigarette companies took it to our High Court. Our High Court um, stayed on the side of government and the public health experts, and they lost the case. We've now got the UK following our example. Now, unfortunately, with food labelling, we've had the same issue. So we introduced a set of um, packaging requirements which were traffic lights, because I think, like you found here, we can't understand the food package parents can't read it. So they actually can't make informed decisions because you have to do a mathematical calculation in the supermarket. And quite often the font size is so small you can't even read it. So we've got you know, food labelling and packaging that people can't make decisions on. They actually don't know what's inside it. And something like the traffic light symbols have really helped children understand, no, that's a sometimes food. And I think this is where technology can really help because through the apps, the children can then have the skills to understand well, what is this product and what does it mean, how much should I have? That is what our app is, it's the Traffic Light app. Yeah, and it's, you know, congratulations for your work because it, the industry is so pervasive like, you know, you've, you've outlined. And then the challenge for ordinary people to be able to make informed decisions is then really difficult, incredibly difficult. You know, I'm kind of chuckling because in another former life of mine, I ran the largest uh, ad agency in Sydney, and this thing was horrible. Yeah. This thing was absolutely horrible, and I thought, well, it's not just America <laughs> getting screwed up, yeah. but Australia's a very healthy population, with the possible exception of four out of five people having skin melanoma. Um, Australia is a very, very, very healthy population. Well, we're people. fourth in the world for child obesity. Yeah, it's actually we're, we're right behind. Well, and it starts with breastfeeding, actually. And here in the US, the same. You know, it's a real challenge for us to maintain world health standard rates on breastfeeding. Here, your biggest purchaser of infant formula is the WIC program. Hmm. So your government is paying to make your citizens sick. And I mean, when you see those statistics, you just go, how could this be the case? How could we be allowing this to happen? And it's, when you look at the health and epidemiology data here, it is really clear 
that the government is funding input formula that it's giving to people that's making them sick. I have a question for you. Um, there, I wanted to see speak upon the food desert comment that you said over there. I watched a documentary, and this is actually when I was in college, and it was in a nutrition report, and provide enough food for three kids in that setting. So I go to, like, for example, McDonald's, and I get this awful meal that I know is so harmful for my kids that it feeds them, and it, they can get up the next morning and be ready for school, and I know that they're not starving. So how do you attack that when like you guys were speaking upon food stamps, and I think that there are some resources, but what happens with the, this huge population of people that seem to not get those resources, or is there a lack of them, or is it the lack of um, tools that they're not seeing or hearing about it, or what, how do you approach that? Um, so I uh, would respond to that, that much more likely to, to be to your children starving yeah. for nutrition than the $5 spent well at the grocery store. Because if you look on a calorie per calorie, cost per calorie basis, then fast food is certainly cheaper. But we don't need empty calories in our country where we have an obesity epidemic. We need nutrition. And if you look at the cost per unit of nutrient density, you can come out much better at the supermarket. If people know that, that while a McDonald's meal seems to be bigger and more filling, if they actually invest that money on a can of beans and a package of rice, they come up much better in terms of their child's health and their satiety because it has a much lower glycemic index. Now, I'm going to, I, I'm, may I add something to that? Since everybody's bringing up McDonald's, if you've been reading the Wall Street Journal, you know where McDonald's is at the moment, and it's not in a good place, and heads are rolling in others. He showed me how paper thin his margins were to run that business. He said, we are always skating on thin ice because corporate is always so nervous about the fact we make money in breakfast, we break even at lunch, and we lose our shirts in the evening. And we make money on cheap sodas. So I talked to him the other day and I said, are you reading everything that you're seeing on Wall Street here? They've had, they've, McDonald's has had three CEOs in the last two years. There, you know, no, nobody can come up with a formula. He said, well, I'll tell you, it's much worse than that. For his side. Uh, he said, people are getting wise. People are starting to realize that you can get quick food that's healthy. You do not have to dangle yourself out there for the next great hamburger. And where McDonald's is now dying on the vine is, the Big Mac is the only Thing that they had that they could hang their hat on and it's passe now and so people are coming into the restaurant for a dollar burger or something you know people who just can't afford anything else but market share for McDonald's is bobsledding downhill and the analysts on Wall Street are saying it's going downhill for one reason and that is the buying trends and the nutrition trends of people in America are set to change they do not want to be led like cattle into McDonald's to get food. And you're seeing that at the store level. So that's kind of an excerpt, you know, I, I think that's a, a very encouraging sign of sorts. Yeah, um, we'll talk about calories and versus nutrients. That seems to also be another big issue is that, like when you have a conversation about food, calories seems to be the first thing that comes up, or you look on a food label, first thing you read is calories, and that doesn't really tell you anything about the nutrient content of something. Mm -hmm. So it seems like in advertising or just like culturally, we need to shift the conversation when we're talking about food away from what the caloric value is into the content. Um, I mean, even where there are laws passed, like for fast foods, if you're a franchise that they have to put the calorie amount on that and even that's not helpful because that's not educating people on well does this meal have enough protein whole grains and fresh fruits and vegetables that i should be getting um, none of that stuff was ever postage on a package voluntarily it was the federal government that came in and said let's start seeing this on the label and you're exactly right calories so what that's a no-brainer and I, I think that where that's coming from is the impact of our habits. 
So our program is not BMI focused, it's not weight focused, it's, it's health focused. And the way we do that is by teaching them the 10 healthy steps. And it's basically a check mark. It's very easy for our families. Every time they come in, they fill our questionnaire about the 10 healthy habits, which comes from the expert to some, you know, expert committee. And then they answer if they're doing those 10 habits. We track that. We review that at every visit. Are you doing these 10 healthy habits? If they're not, this is the area of improvement. The calories came in because we're focused on weight. The weight of the nation, which steers the direction of not to talk about packaged foods, is to talk about calories. So this is coming from the giant, who's really steering the conversation, instead of the health professionals being able to steer the conversation. Why are health professionals not as effective? There is no money backing these politicians. Plain and simple, right? So we can create the 10 healthy steps. We can change our system to talk about that. Instead, we have health institutions who are based just on BMI. That is not the best indicator of health. You can have an appropriate BMI and still be eating McDonald's and still be eating Costco foods and packaged foods that we haven't even addressed and talked about in the, you know, extensively. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about sleep. We're not talking about physical activity. We're not talking about eating meals at the table. We're not talking about, about having home-cooked meals as a strategy. We're talking about just calories, and that is definitely not a strategy that is effective. And it's confusing. I believe the toolbox is set. Back in the day when I started advertising, there were four ways to get a message out. TV, radio, any of you have ever heard of that? Radio, right. print, outdoor. That was it. Now, there are so many things in the toolbox for reaching people, zillions of people. I have a television show that reaches 85 million households now. 85 million households. And the satellite is pinging that people are watching the show. And I'm going, 85 million people? Oh, wow. You know, shouldn't I be getting some kind of really amazing message out to people with all those captive ears? So you're exactly right. Advertising is very, very, very strong. The other thing that we haven't talked about is, if you identify the enemy, you have two choices, to fight them or to join hands with them. And I, it's very political, but winning part of the battle is very often better than everybody retreating to their corners because the guys with the money are going to win in that case. So maybe part of the drive is to go to the real bad people creating all the junk and leverage them in a way that doesn't off put their, their own sales to start slightly creating things. Look what is happening with McDonald's right now. McDonald's in the highest level meetings is, and you started to see it in the stores now. McDonald's is being told, uh, let's not push the soda so much. Uh, let's switch over and get some more salads in there. Yeah, let's offer like Carl's Jr. does. Let's offer an all natural burger with no preservatives. Let's uh, do, 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 you know, all this kind of stuff. And that was somebody having a conversation with the guys with all the money who will sell you the junk unchallenged and somebody coming back and saying, eh, maybe let's tone it down a little bit. Let's see what we can do. And if, if their money is behind what we're trying to do, you're going to see some changes happen. Yeah. And we did this because we had one statistic, and the statistic was home health is growing in America 13% a year. And we started to break it down and we realized home health is important for two reasons. First, is it cheaper to treat Uncle Ralph in the acute setting of a hospital or titrate him with morphine at home with, in a friendly environment with people he loves? And secondly, if we can demonstrate that we're lowering that cost by increasing the quality of life aspect, what are the insurance companies? which run the world. What do they think about that idea? And all of a sudden, home health just took off. And it spawned all kinds of in industries that were built around, okay, we'll give you the notion it might be better for you and more healthy, but you have to give us something. And what you give us is, somehow, we're creating something in the economy that's good for everybody. And that's, I think that's something we have to do too. And that would be one reason to work with the big food companies uh, because you can't, you can't torpedo the whole economy just because we feel 
we, we saw what happened for decades with cigarette smoking. I'm sure you guys did. Did you see the documentary at that? Yeah. The, they kind of tapped in on that idea, right? In that, when they spoke upon Michelle Obama coming up with these uh, new ideas of bringing uh, activities for kids and trying to lower obesity rates. But some of the problems in that, and I know, yeah, <laughs> some of the problems in that is all these big brands, just to get their ratings up and so that they wouldn't lose money in this because they're like, oh my gosh, a public. Speaker and, and Michelle Obama is touching on this, we're going to lose drastic amounts of money in it. They started saying, okay, it's fat free, and then they added all the sugar in. Mm -hmm. So these huge brands, even though they may do these things and have with this idea, such as the salads, well, the salads, those dressings are just as bad as a burger sometimes. So it's it's hard where you, I mean, you want to work with these companies because I totally agree with you. I mean, they have the money and because of that, it's going to be hard to make a force. And I know I'm, I'm kind of saying something that is, you know, it's such a hard topic and and kind of, there's just not really a good way to go about it. But I, I just am interested in your guys' standpoint on that one. I saw that I was so frustrated because they, they did something and they get out there and the kids were like, oh, see, it's fat free, can they have it? And so we start taking it and then all of a sudden the sugar levels are rising. So it's, yeah. I, I think the, camp, the companies want to work with you. Yeah. Um, this is usually a sponsor of their national campaign. I think dietitians want to do the right thing. Uh, I think their hearts are there. But I think these companies outsmart you at the end of the day. And I think that that's the difficult part about it, is they do want to, but their stakeholders are also important. And so I don't know that that could easily happen. Well, and the perception worldwide, and I, I launched a, uh, the first Bluetooth wireless glucometer for diabetes some years ago. And we didn't want to launch it in America because FDA was too tough. So we went to Europe and got CE approval, and then we went to some other countries. We went to Telstra in Australia. We did the mobile platform there. Um, and what we learned from is we're all about treat. We're all about treating things. Everywhere else in the world, it's about prevention. But we have huge pharma companies. We have huge companies of all kinds. That if you go to if you ever go to Old San Juan, Puerto Rico, which is a U.S. territory, and you go traveling out in the outlands. You think you're in the middle of nowhere, and you start coming upon these immense buildings. Glaxo, Eli Lilly, yeah? all the pills in America are made in old San Juan, Puerto Rico because of the favorable tax advantages there. And you go by all these pill places, and you say to yourself, oh my God, is America really taking this many pills? And the fact is, yeah, they are. So, you know, I think that other countries are watching America and, and getting worried. We are getting some of young children that they are forcing them to go to fat camps um, at young ages um, because they say they're not going to be prepared to fight or to work because in Singapore they have a weight requirement for work and they're finding more and more people unable to um, to get jobs because of this. So they, they, see the Ameri they see themselves going in the direction and I know Australia is up there. I mean, a lot of other countries are looking at America and going, oh my God, you, do not, you don't want to get there. And as the globalization of these food issues are happening, right, they can't, and we talk about Pop-Tarts with the Singaporeans, they cannot believe their kids have started to eat Pop-Tarts for breakfast, but they are. And so they, they see that the, the marketing has infiltrated a lot of Well, remember markets. Singapore will cane you for <laughs> spitting on the sidewalk too, so yeah, there's a lot of strange stuff. Yeah. You know, I've got two kids, seven and seven year old daughter and five year old son. And uh, you know, they come from school and they tell us you know, nothing that's gospel. Dad parents say something, you know, that's like no. <laughs> so I mean what's your opinion? Yeah, I hate to break it to you, it only gets worse. <laughs> peer, peer message is definitely to a message. Those are habit driven. They're not weight driven. And so I think we're, we're changing that culture in that town, and that town meets, it's, it's actually beautiful, they meet for physical activity because they know they have low-income families in Sunnyvale, which a lot of people don't believe. They know that there's food access, and they're able to provide that. So if you get the right players meeting, and it's taken about two or three years to get rolling, but once you do, and you change it to habit-focused, yes, it could be very powerful, but they also have a parenting component. 
So they're, they're doing it both ways. There's actually educators that are coming in, teaching the parents to go back to basics, back to the cookie. They're also addressing it habit focused, and their community is rich with resources and is willing to help these families who might not be able to do it on their own because we can't think individualistic. We can't. We have to think as a community. My, my kids' lunchbox has come back with the bro broccoli just the way it is, and the rest of the food is gone. Right? So there, there is a, I think we're, I mean, we're obviously McDonald's and the big guys, they're, some, they're doing something because our taste buds are telling us something, right? So what's, how do you, you know, fight that battle? I mean, there's a bigger problem. I, I don't know how, I mean, I'm fight, facing that myself, right? So every, how do you? Well, we, one of the strategies that I give that is effective, simple, is just not have them in the home because they're going to compete. If you're finding and you're deciding, should I keep this food in the house or not, ask yourself, is it competing with the fruits and vegetables or with the product that I want them to eat? Traditional meals, which happens a lot in our families, right? They don't want to eat the traditional meal. They want to eat the American food that they receive. Then that, that's, if it's competing, then we need to pull it out so that we can regain a little bit of the leadership. That's not to say that it's a forbidden food. That shouldn't be interpreted that way. It should be like, like the sometimes food that is, it's, you're able to have it, but it's not a food that you traditionally bring home. It's a food that you consume outside of the home. We actually send lists to the parents, often to the dad, saying, your child tells us you're bringing these foods in the house and they can't resist them. So please take them out. And um, we tell them, keep the food in the trunk if you think you're going to need it at night, but don't bring the foods in the house. It's just. Willpower is so unfair to think that kids are going to have willpower. So let's not let's not ask them to have willpower. Instead, just don't put the foods in the house. And one more comment on that broccoli comment: keep putting that broccoli in the lunchbox because somewhere in that child's brain, it is going to imprint that in my lunches there was always something green and something fresh. And someday, when that child is making their own decisions about food, those visions will come back, and that child will make sensible decisions. Secondly, make the broccoli so damn delicious that that child wants to eat it. You know, put a bit of butter on it, put a little, little salt on it, a little bit of, of good goodness, or make a stir fry with a little bit of plum sauce and a little bit of soy sauce so that it gets that balance of sweet and sour that we do find so appealing. If you make vegetables delicious and you celebrate them as parents, you say, oh my god, this is delicious. Your children are going to probably follow suit. It might take a while, but eventually they will, because they'll see it's bringing so much enjoyment to the people they trust. I want broccoli for dinner now. <laughs> 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 hey, we touched on insurance a little bit, but to be more specific, I was wondering if you guys could speak to insurance reimbursement for the programs you offer. Ours is free, so I can't speak to that. We are working with insurance companies getting to pay it. We have three of the five largest um, insurance companies doing pilots right now with that program, and um, we are hoping to get them to cover it. That's certainly our goal, and we know how important that is. Um, I can't tell you that's easy, <laughs> and it takes a really long time. And it is, but we have three, three of the biggest insurance companies are working are doing pilots right now, and we're hoping we can get it covered eventually. Or, did you have to prove um, sort of proof of outcome yeah. in order to get? And so we had to do proof of outcome to get to the pilot stage. Yeah, <laughs> this takes a really long time. For those of you who are in the health industry, um, we did proof of outcome to get into pilots. Now we're reproving our outcomes with each one of them individually. Um, but they did it. One of the insurance companies, Humana, did it for their employees, and that still wasn't enough. So now they're doing another pilot. Um, so. You kind of get in pilot zone with them, but well, we are having to prove our data. But once they prove the data, the other thing is employers are actually much less worried about the specific data. So we we have employers who are paying for it for their families, and um, they're 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 also doing pilots, but they're a little bit less focused on the specific data. And I'm gonna have to interject. We love this topic because we completely lost track of time. So 